just saw with um, Mayor Pigott. That's a hard act to follow there. But I assure you, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that you guys, um, that this is engaging, that this is worth your energy and it's worth your time. I apologize for the background. We were all going for the same background. Unfortunately, it's pouring rain here. And every time I, I put my um, my virtual screen up, it, it glitches a little. So I wanted to not give you half of a session. So this is pretty interactive. Um, I'm hoping that all of you will, will engage. All of you will find, because um, I'm going to ask some questions and I'm going to need some people to, to get back at me. Um, a little bit about myself before I, I share the screen. I'm sure you guys read the bio, if it's even, you know, if that was even a necessity, but we're going to keep it short. So my name is Shirley Planton. I'm an attorney by trade. I'm a member of the Florida Gang Investigative Association for the state of Florida. I have been such for well over 13, maybe 15 years or so. I ain't going to tell y'all my age. Um, I'm also a... Um, I run a firm called u turn Use Consulting, and my job, somebody is, yeah, I think I need to mute everybody. Hold on. Thank you. Um, so my, the heart of what I do is really, so the, the firm is called u turn Use Consulting. The part that everybody always tells me, well, you forget to tell people. I am an author. I authored a book called The Backstory of a New Reality, um, Jaw-Dropping Unmasking of Urban Youth Violence. It has its accompanying workbook. We are no um, strangers to Broward County, particularly the Equity and Diversity Department. Love the entire team, love working with them. Our mission is very simple. It's really to unmask the, um, the backstories um, that contribute to the school to prison pipeline and thereby the youth and gun violence in our community. And we do that really by looking at the intersectional ties, right, of systems. And that's why I thought that this presentation and this training is possibly the most timely after what we just saw with um, Mayor Pigott. Because indeed, the, 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 the word that he said that really stuck with me or the quote that really stuck with me is building up our children. But before we can build up our children, we also need to understand from whence they come, right? So today we're celebrating um, Liberation Day, Freedom Day, Emancipation, and we're honoring and we're commemorating, you know, the history that's being made. But as part of that history, we can never forget the historical, the historical contributions that have led our communities to be where they are right now. But more importantly, we also cannot allow for our systems we can't negate that the systems have played an important role in what we're seeing happen to our young people. So today we're gonna have a very frank conversation. Um, I do the summer of learning as well. So anyone who's ever taken my course, you know we're all about keeping it 100%. We're all about keeping it real. In fact, like the kids say, no cap. Um, it's about a lit moment. We snap, we get the information in, but more importantly, it's about making sure that we are all on the same page for the advancement of our young people. Because we can celebrate liberation, we can celebrate emancipation until we turn blue. But if our young people who are supposed to be carrying the baton, they themselves don't feel that they are a part of this, then it's almost as if our freedom and our emancipation is limited. So I'm going to share, right? I'm going to go right into sharing. What I will ask, though, um, this is a conversation. So please engage, whether it's on the chat, raise your hand, do whatever you want, because at the end of the day, I can turn till I turn, I can talk till I turn purple, but if you guys are not engaged and the, the quantity and the quality of what's been happening with this conference has always been about engagement. It's been about the snap snaps. It's been about making sure we all know, you know, we're rooted and grounded in our feelings and we don't want to take any of that away. So I'm going to ask a question. Can I move forward? And this is just part of my test to see if I'm going to get some feedback. Can I move forward? Can I go into the presentation or y'all still with me? Come on. Show me something, talk to me. Yes, ma'am, yes, come on with it. Yes, yes, go, move forward, let's go. Great job, I, I had to test y'all out. So since I didn't test y'all out and y'all didn't answer it, we gonna keep the party moving. Can you guys see my screen? Now I can't, so somebody gonna have to come off and say yes, cause I can't see my chat no more cause I'm sharing. Yes, we can see your screen, Dr. Panton. 
Thank you so much. Okay, so in the midst of this conversation, um, I like to I like to premise all of my conversation by making sure that we're all in the same book. In the body of work that I have done, um, I have had the privilege of accompanying parents to bury their children. I have stood in the gap with parents who, when we were getting ready to do the viewing, and the funeral home said, no, y'all gonna have to take your body back because we've already been threatened that if we have this view in here, they're gonna shoot it up. Um, and I want you to put yourself in the place of a parent who's trying to figure out, first of all, they're going through the trauma of losing their child. And now the trauma of having to figure out how am I going to put my rest my child, lay my child to rest. And then I've had, and I call it the, the I call it an opportunity and a blessing to stand in the gap with a family whose child was shot 18 times and by God's grace survived. So I say all of that to say, and then I've had the opportunity to stand with another family who, who lost their daughter for 21 days to human trafficking and we had to pull her out of a dumpster, luckily alive. So this is personal to me. When I talk about our black and our brown youth and I listen to the mayor Pigott, who we are often in parallel tracks in the community doing this body of work, I like to talk about where we are right now, where our children are and what we need to do to ensure that the emancipation, the history of our ancestors are not lost upon them as we move forward because they are indeed all that we have moving forward. They are indeed the, you know, our ancestors' wildest dream. But if they don't live to see or to live to become the best that they can possibly be, then how free really are we? So today, I really wanted to put that context of why we're having this conversation because in the past two and a half weeks, if nothing else, we've had to take a stand back and say, what the hell is happening right now to our young black and brown youth? And I really want us to put it in the context that their backstories matter too. Um, I'm very big on the word backstories because a lot of times we wanna drop those things as though they didn't matter. Every last one of us has a backstory and our backstories either dictate who we are, they either serve as hindrances, barriers, or we utilize them to propel us to the next level. That being said, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page and we're talking about the training objectives, right? Participants will be exposed to the various factors contributing to the youth violence and how those elements are creating a state of emergency amongst our youth in the communities. I want us to understand as educators, as providers, as practitioners, if we are not reaching our youth, if the information that Mayor Pigott and all the information that all of the other presenters will present have presented last week as, re as we reference equity and diversity and will be presenting today, if we are not transferring that knowledge to our young people, then we have failed them. Then there is a fracture in how we move forward. Then we need to really consider how free really are we? Because if our children cannot continue to propel the mission, if our children cannot truly understand the value of the freedom, the work that had to be done, the, the work that Harriet Tubman did to help our people understand and move forward, then somewhere along the way, some of us need to stand up and say, we've got to do a better job. So through this, I want us to understand our young people are indeed living in a state of emergency. Why and how? We're going to get into that in just a little bit. So let's talk about what backstories are, right? Um, as providers, we like to to be very blunt and we want exact and precise words. Let me tell y'all something, that ain't what we doing today. So exact and precise words, we gonna, I'm gonna give y'all a list of words and we are gonna talk about them a little bit. So what are backstories? A lot of people like to say to me, but Dr. Plan, what are backstories? Backstories, for those of y'all who wanna make sure we're all on the same page again, are root causes. They're what we call contributing factors. They're contributing elements, they're compounding elements, they're origins. And I skipped one in particular because as a result of everything that we saw last year with the George Floyd protests and the movements, one of the words that became very, um, one of the, the terms that became very loosely used is the term lived experiences. Your backstory is indeed your lived experience because all of us may be black, but we don't have the same lived experience. All of us may be brown, we don't share the same lived experience. 
All of us may be white. All of us may be Asian, but our backstories are going to be different. You can have two and three kids in the same household that experience three very different lived experience. What do I mean by that? That first child that we were trying, you know, they used to be babied and they were the the uh, the, uh, the apple of their parents' eye until child number two came along and the child number two. So the first child took all the harsh um you know, discipline and you can't do this and you won't do this and you've got to be the standard barriers for the other. Then the second one came along and you have the mentality of the middle child syndrome. Child, they, you know, they, they don't pay me no mind. And then the baby came along and the middle child syndrome really became a problem because that middle child just felt as though I don't matter as much as the first and they don't pay as much attention to me as, as much as the baby. So we can all be in the same household and not have the exact same experience. And we need to be very mindful of that our lived experiences are going to dictate our tomorrow. Our lived experiences are going to dictate how we handle and how we deal with people. Our lived experiences, or rather, should I say, the lived experiences of our ancestors are how we're able to experience America the way we experience it now. How far we've come? Very far. How far we have to go? Even farther. And that, that trajectory is dependent on who we are and our lived experience. So this picture right here, I really wanted us to be very mindful of. Um, this is 2016. This is Miami-Dade in Broward County. And I, I put this picture in because I really wanted us to be very clear on who we were talking about. If you look at this picture, these were the number of kids that died between, this was just in 2016. There are new pictures out. We choose not to utilize them because we don't want to um, re-traumatize some families that are still dealing with this. But it is imperative that we look at these pictures and understand that they are a makeup of all races, all hues, all colors, all ages. So that says to me, if our children and our teens are being lost at the rate that we're losing them, we gotta really, we gotta really rethink how far we've come and what else is left for us to do in order to truly live out the full experience of Juneteenth. So I, I have some people who love, you know, who love stats and they have to have stats in order for them to really believe that folks know what they're talking about. So for those few people who got to have the statistics, here are your statistics because everything moving forward is not about statistics because every statistic has a story behind it. And every statistic can be utilized to tell the story you want it to tell. But I understand if you need stats and I understand if you need numbers. So here you go. So in a decade from 2006 to 2016, there's a whole new phenomenon when we look at 2017 moving forward. 316 children were killed by gun violence, an average of 30 a year. I have, I have about 25 participants right now in this session. That would mean that in a year, all of us would have been wiped clean. That should concern us. Right. As teachers and educators, many of you have about 25, 30, 35 students in a class in a year's time. If we continue the way that the, the, the trajectory has been in the past, the history that shows us the trajectory of where we're going, that would say to me that most of your classes would be wiped out in one year. And those deaths are a result of domestic arguments, children caught in the crossfire of gun battles between gangs and teens, rare instances, children's playing with accidental guns. This last one really bothers me a little because there was a young lady most recently between the ages, I think she's 22, 23, who just accidentally shot her 18 year old sister leaving, um, leaving South Beach on Memorial Day because what they're doing is we're being cute and we're branding the gun and we're playing with the gun and she put the gun to her sister, 18 year old sister's head and she shot her mistake. So yesterday they upped her charge because at first it was negligent and now we're, now we're looking at manslaughter. And the reason that I'm saying this is because it is not just our children. We need to be concerned from zero to cradle to career because our 22, 23 and 24 year olds it is concerning about where we're going. It should concern us because this isn't what our ancestors fought for. But before we can begin to blame and point the finger, we got to look at what the backstories are. Y'all still with me? Y'all quiet. Y'all still with me? Yes. Okay. So a lot of times when something happens, many people like to say, but who are the victims? Oh my God, our heart goes out to the families. And, you know, we want to really have these conversations. What else did we know about these kids? Oh my God, they could have been, because y'all know everybody's children are good kids. 
So what else did we know about these children and what was going on at home? Who was there to help them? How many of, what could I have done differently? But these aren't questions that we should just be asking when the child is a victim, whether they survive or they die. But these are questions that as, as members of the human race, as members of the black community, we should have been asking before, right? But then we often like to ask how, you know, how could have the police done a better job to keep them safe? What else could the parents have done to keep them safe? The one question that we rarely ask is what was the backstory? What was going on that led that child? And it's funny because lately we're starting to hear so many more of those questions, particularly around the El Mula shooting, the shooting in Kendall, and the many other shootings that we've had in the past two weeks. But then my question to you, we, have, we can sympathize with the victims and their families. Now I ask or I challenge you to ask the very same question about the shooters. What else did we know about these kids? What are they dealing with at home? How many teachers came in contact with them and may have been able to serve as an intermediary? How many police officers came in contact with them to say, hey, you're headed down the wrong path? How many after school programs would help? What else could we have done to help keep this child safe? The problem is what we fail to realize is that shooter too needed the same grace. That shooter too should have had people intervene because before they became a shooter, they were one of our kids. And then we need to look at why is this behavior normal? What were, and we're not often asking, what was the backstory of what was happening to that child? Why is it acceptable in our community to take a life and then we're silent? One of the things that I want us to be very mindful of, and I told y'all this would be a very blunt and a very honest conversation because we celebrate and commemorate where we are right now. But then we, it, we are also at an intersect in our lives as Black people where we need to begin to have some very courageous conversations. So last year, I, I, I taught courageous conversations beyond diversity. And now we need to be having a courageous conversation as far as where are we? How far have we really come? And where are we going? Because the many people that I saw marching on the streets, because one of my jobs in my other hat is to actually sit and mitigate community tensions in our communities. And part of what I found is I marched 18 to 19 of the George Floyd protests against police brutality. And it was a hue of people. They were young people. There were older people. There were seasoned people. Everybody was screaming for justice and fairness. And we were demanding that we would no longer continue the injustice upon black communities, particularly upon black men. And we were screaming that black lives matter. And we were screaming that everybody should have a right to succeed. And then our black children die and all you hear is silence. It's crickets. So then that forces me to ask if the silence of the death of our children is deafening, then we got a whole nother courageous conversation that we need to have. Are our children not as valuable? Are our black lives not, a, do, do the black lives of young children not matter as much as the black life of a young black man who may have had an experience with police? We need to have some heart-to-heart -heart conversation to say to ourselves, every black child should matter. Every brown child should matter. Better yet, every child should matter. Because at the end of the day, they are our future. At the end of the day, if there is not another generation for us to pass on the history, if there isn't another generation for us to build up, then where do we leave our community? Too many of our kids are sitting in the criminal justice system. Too many of our kids are being dealt the blow of having understood and being treated as an adult by being direct filed. Too many of our kids are going unaddressed and too many of our kids, too many black parents are burying their babies. And as a community, we remain silent. We got some conversations we need to have and we are gonna start today. So, first things first. And I'm gonna need some people to talk to me when, when I show this picture, not on the chat, get off your mic and let's engage a little. When you see this picture, what do you see? Who wants to go first? Nobody? Nobody wanna come off their mics? Turn your mic on and tell me what you think. Cause see, everything uh, depends, go ahead. I, I hear somebody um, coming on. Oh, uh, uh, mom lion taking care of her baby. Good, but that, but see, it all depends on the perspective, right? Because what we see, if we choose to have a positive view, we look at the front and we realize that that's what's happening. 
But then there's also that negative view that someone may choose based on their backstory to think that that is a, that is a mom that's either eating her baby, they may not even go as far as assuming that it's a mom. It's just another per it's just another um lion eating their eating their baby or eating another baby. Perspective dictates who we are. Anybody else? Thank you, Sherry. Anybody else? No problem. It, I good. don't know if you can can you hear me? I can. Hi. I don't when I'm looking at the negative viewpoint, I see that you can only see the profile. So ah. you can only see what's on the surface. I don't know if that cub's head is on the other side. So sometimes we don't have the whole picture mm -hmm. when we're looking at other cultures, looking at other people, and we don't take time to understand what is going on. We just look on the surface. So before we have that negative viewpoint, we, um, we need to maybe take time to have those conversations and dig a little deeper before we make those judgments. Very well said, Donna. Anybody else? Yes, it's the two different sides of one story. Ah. So the danger of a single story, not mm -hmm. taking the time to go beyond just telling one perspective or one side. And I think all three answers are exactly what we were looking for. Good job, Naomi. I think. The reality is a lot of times when we are either in our classrooms, in our schools, we're counseling, we're teaching, whatever other capacity you are serving a child, a lot of times we're not taking the totality of that child into consideration, either because we're utilizing an evidence-based curriculum or we're utilizing a, a, a scale that says, this is, these are the questions we gonna ask, this is what I need this child to answer. But behind every answer, there's a story, right? And that negative viewpoint, if you don't have the totality, if you don't have the entire bad story, how can you truly engage this child, right? And then there are some people who come in already with a positive viewpoint, negating that there may be some negativity that that child is dealing with and feel as though they're just children. What negativity could they possibly be dealing with? And both of them, both entrance at its inception is wrong. So it is a necessity to get the full story. And it also is a necessity to not just go in all honky dory, just assuming that because this is a child, everything should be okay. Everything we do from the way we treat people, from the way we love people, to the way we, um, we show our, our biases, be they implicit or explicit, be the way that we, um, we discuss equality, all of it is based on our lived experience, but more importantly, is based on your viewpoint. Because I can't expect you to walk in my shoes if you've never even been exposed to my household. Better yet, there is this mindset that we have that everybody should be able to pull themselves up by the bootstrap, but what if I ain't got no boots? Or what if I have boots and I ain't got no straps? So we need to be able to look at the totality of circumstances because then and only then can we truly begin to meet children where they are to build them up and make them the best possible leaders that we need them to be. Um, I know I gotta get y'all out of here by 12 o'clock. So we are gonna run through this because I wanna make sure that there is discussion towards the end. So part of what I want us to be mindful of while we're having these discussions, right? About backstories is because so many of these pictures are exactly what our young people are living with. We often see the image of a young black and brown man or woman being arrested. Then you have the whole concept of the drugs and the parties and people not realizing that the drugs and the parties are part of the challenges that our young people are dealing with on social media. And then we're not looking at, we're not acknowledging that many of our young girls and young boys are being sold, not being sold by people that are coming out of the country, not being sold or being purchased by people, you know, big markets. And, you know, because up there is a huge black market race, a whole black market concept for young black and brown girls where the boys are worth more than the girls and we'll dive into that a little bit more but realizing that many of our parents are putting children up for sale i've had children up for sale at seven years old of a parent who put a little girl up so the reality is when we begin to move from our privilege and open our eyes to what's really happening then we can begin to meet our children where they are and then the picture on the bottom left it has become so common. It's the guns, it's the drugs, it's the smoking. And we're not realizing what's happening to our children and their brains. One of the ones that's missing off of here, and I really dive into it in the next um, slide, is really the role of 
social media. We're going to play on that a little bit. But when we have music and we have people that are glorifying the amount of, you know, heads they got on a plate, which means the amount of people that they've killed. This ain't Biggie and Tupac. They used to talk about what they want to do to each other. These are young people that we are glorifying. We're playing their music. People are, pa are paying to hear their music to talk about the names of the people that they've shot. We have a problem that we need to address. So as we celebrate Juneteenth, as we celebrate freedom and liberation, something else has our other aspects of our communities tied and bonded to a slavery that we need to then look at what is it exactly that we're bonded to. And then the second one is the concept of, again, that human trafficking, that whole concept that there is a whole market, $32 billion market, where our children are being sold and many of us are, real, are acting as though none of this is happening. And then lastly, the image on the right hand corner at the bottom has become too normal for us. We have become so desensitized. It's almost as if seeing a black young man in, in correctional clothing is acceptable. We've become too desensitized to what should not be our norm. Our black men, our black and brown young men carry generations in their bodies. They carry, they carry not just generations, but they carry us as a community moving forward. There are no children without black men and brown men. So as we talk about how far we have come as a generation and how the systemic racism in the past, the number one thing that they did through slavery was to break apart families. We're still doing that, right? Because the, in order for some people to get households, you can't even have a man in the household or you can't get your check. So we need to understand we may have won the war, but the battle is still happening. And we need to ask ourselves, what do we do different? Who do we hold accountable? I only got a couple more to go, y'all. Bear with me. So in the book, we address what are some of those realities. When you have a generation of young people that say to you, right, and they call me SP, the young people call me SP, and they say, man, SP, we ain't living out here, man. We're just trying to survive. We're just trying to exist to the next day because, and then we as providers, we walk up and we say, well, when, you know, where do you see yourselves five years from now? You're automatically in a different book because this kid is trying to survive seeing tomorrow morning. And you talk about five years from now because your reality is not their reality. I often like to tell people as well, a child that's hungry, a child that's homeless, a child who is suffering from the things that these kids have suffered from this past year, where do you see yourself five years from now just seems like a generation away from them. So we need to understand they are living in a constant state of fight or flight. They're, I mean, it, that just is what it is, their urgency. Their backstories, young people feel as though we as adults and providers and people that are supposed to be working with and for them don't care about their backstories. We don't care to hear where they come from. And because they feel that way, they don't come to us as their help. They turn to someone else that may be in the same situation as they are. And oftentimes they lead them down the wrong path. We also have to understand because of systemic issues that we're dealing with, as we celebrate Juneteenth, we need to be very mindful of what's happening right now in our communities and in our country. The same people who just voted to make Juneteenth a federal holiday just told us we couldn't talk about the real history of being Black. What are we doing? The same people that just told us we want you to be free and we're going to celebrate the freedom of Black people, right? This told us at the same time, um, I don't want to have to pay you $15 an hour because you know why? Because it hurts my pocket. While it hurts my pocket, a mom and a dad got to work two and three jobs making sure that I'm out of the household and it's impacting my children. But now my children got to get on the street and my children got to find a way to make some money. And as they're helping out, the role reversal is switching because when my child is coming home with an iPhone I didn't pay for, with a car I didn't pay for, because he's breaking me off and putting some money in my pocket or the nails or the hairdo that I didn't pay for, because they're helping me out, that child is no longer a child. Now they see themselves as my equal. We need to understand our children are living on the edge. That key reality, the games that our children are playing, the Fortnite, the GTA, and the many others that we allow our kids to play, they have become such a reality for our children that our children cannot differentiate e-reality versus real reality. That if I shoot in, in, in GTA, they gonna pop up around the corner. That's not happening in real life. So the question then becomes, how are we feeling our kids? And, and I always say this, COVID was a great example of this. When COVID came out, till today, we're having this conversation about how exactly do, how did we get here? 
until we begin to look at youth violence and gun violence from the epidemiology of the problem, from the backstory, its origin, we don't solve it because you can't put a Band-Aid on the epidemic. The reality is our children are in a state of emergency. And it's not just all, all our children, right? Because we like to say it's Black, poor kids. It's kids that are coming from a broken homes. It's kids that are coming. No, 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 no. I think if anything, COVID just taught us that many of our kids are set up to deal with some, they are not prepared to deal with issues that we supposedly claim we, pre we prepared them to deal with. Our at-risk youth, whether it's educational, emotional, learning disabilities, our kids are into trouble. I have, I remember one of my gangs that I was dealing with, in order for you to be a part of a gang, you had to have an IEP. What kid knows what an IEP is? But that's their reality because they feel that they can't, they're not good enough to be a part of the big gang, so we're gonna create our own gang. And we call this 600. So at the end of the day, and then we have this false nomer that again, I say only poor black and brown kids are participating. These parties that are happening on the beach, and these parties and these guns and these drug habits and these drug parties that are really big, this ch these challenges into bestiality, guess who's funding a lot of it? Wealthy kids too. Guess who's going through some of the same challenges our, our poor black and brown kids are going through? You know who's doing it? Some of the wealthy kids because some of the same attention that they're, that, that our, that our students are, are craving, they too are craving. So when you, when you got a young man who becomes, who is worth $1,700 before he goes through puberty and his value drops to about 1,200 and a young lady's worth 1,500 and then her value drops when she goes through puberty to about $900. This is the reality that our kids are dealing with in these communities. And as adults, as black and brown people who are celebrating how far we've come, we're failing them because we're remaining silent right now. I think I only got two more, y'all. Two more. I'm gonna get y'all out. I promise. So I wanted to put this in context. I'm gonna read this because I, I need for all of us to kind of get back to reality and understand what other people are going through. Some of y'all need to come back to reality. Walk around here downgrading people because of their struggles. Stop acting like you've never had to call and get a bill extended. Stop acting like you've never had to eat what you had because you couldn't afford what you wanted. To catch a bus, stop acting like you've never had to catch a bus or catch a ride with someone because you don't have a car. Stop acting like you never had anyone in your family or close to you that do or been on drugs. Stop judging people and their struggles. Remember, God sits high and he looks low. Be mindful because the struggles of someone else may become the struggles of yours today. And a part of what we don't do, and a lot of times we're quick to talk about privilege, not realizing that their privilege isn't just a white versus black thing. There's a black versus black privilege. Because once we have moved on up in the ladder, we feel as though these things don't matter to us. So real quick, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go to a very, um, to a point that a lot of us like to talk about. Well, oh my God, this all starts in the home. What are the parents and what are the parents doing? I agree, it does start in the home. I like to tell parents all the time, I ain't tell you to have no kids. But now that the kids are here, they become all of our responsibility. But the problem that we have is that home is a fully loaded word. So when we're talking about children and we're talking about how far we've come, as a people, the home used to be a village. As a people, the upbringing of your child and the success of your child was the success of my child because it was the success of the community. So as we celebrate Juneteenth, we can't lose those values of what made us a great people, what continues to make us a great people, but is also a threat of us not being a great people when we stop looking at everybody else's child as our children. Who's home? Is home a safe place? Because a lot of times the very first place that a child is victimized is in the home. Can I even be home because of everything that's happening in a home? Is home a safe place? Because a lot of times the very first gun that's put in a child's hand is happening in a home. Is as a result of a parent saying, man up and show me what you made of, right? Are the parents there? Is, and then we have to begin to question, what is home? What happens to our kids that have home insecurity? What happens to our kids that don't know if a mom is gonna be home because of their immigration status? So when we talk about home, Home as we define it now and home as it was being defined when we were trying to make our way through were two different things. And we can't forget to realize that our systems have changed. The, we have changed as a people because as we've progressed, we've lost many of our values. And then one of the things that we need to be very mindful of, our children are craving to hear I love you. 
Our children are craving to belong. Our children are craving to understand who they are. And when we stop passing down our tradition, when we stop creating an opportunity for us to learn from one another, for us to really pass down who we are as a people, that history that Mayor Piggott talked about today, we are not just failing ourselves, but we're failing them and we're failing generations of young people because we already know we ain't getting the full history in the school system. So then that means as a people, we need to do better creating atmospheres where we're passing down the generation, where we're passing down the, the, the culture, where we're passing down things through the eyes of blackness, not through the eyes of people who want to tell us who our, who our history is. And then I'm going to leave this here. Why should this matter to me? Because as educators, you format the minds of generations to come. I was on a Zoom last night, and one of the things that touched my heart after I was done, someone, someone inboxed me and said, great job, Dr. Planton my former rocket student. And it, it baffled me that, oh my God, I got one of my, and I'm like, who is this teacher? And then I, I really sat back and thought about it. it. was my junior English teacher. And she wrote me an email that said, you have truly made all of us proud because we realized that when we poured into you, you're pouring back into our community. Educators are the lifeline of who we are as a community, a lifeline of who we are as black people because education is all we've got they can't be taken away from us. Social service providers can only support what you do. The funders who don't understand, law enforcement, healthcare providers, academia, we realized this past year as a result of the pandemic, all of these systems have failed us and all of these systems have failed our children. But the one thing that we can honestly say that can't be taken away is what we pour into our kids, is the education that we give them. So as we pass down those educational instructive materials. Let's make sure to give it to them as raw as it comes. Let's make sure to give it to them with love. Let's make sure to give it to them looking at that child as your own, because God only knows in this world of social media, they may well interact with your child. Because a lot of times we just think, oh, these kids will never have to deal with my children because I live on the West side. I live in the good community. Hey, my child will never have, but you fail to realize they cross path and they cross culture based on social media. So is there a solution? I got two slides and I got four minutes. Is there a solution? Yeah, there's a solution, but there's not one solution. The first solution is one solution doesn't exist. The second part is it's a multi-solution approach where all of us, that village, children are a product of their environment. That home, that school, that community, and that church, we are all responsible for the success of these children. We are all responsible for the success of the black community. We are all responsible for the success of our human race because interconnectivity is real. We are part of an ecosystem. And when that link is broken, when that chain is broken because we're not strong enough as a people, we're not strong enough as a community, we break the cycle. Understand, this country is built on our shoulders. So when we fail, whether they want to admit it or not, Juneteenth taught us this. When we fail, the community fails. And we can see that clearly with the whole, um, what's the term that they use? Um, essential employees. Many of those essential employees that, that kept this country going through the pandemic looked like you and many looked like me and many of you on this call. So clearly, our link to the ecosystem is important. Parental involvement, I have to put, we gotta start with the parents, but let's not just point the fingers at the parents, let's assist the parents. Let's attempt to understand what are you going through? What's your backstory? Let's serve the whole child, understanding that that child cannot progress academically if, fail, if home is failing them. That child cannot progress. A child who doesn't know where their next meal is coming from don't care about ABCs. A child who doesn't know where they're about to lay their head, if parent is gonna be home, don't care about no two times two equals four. It's just the, the whole concept of the Maslow hierarchy. And then I want to, again, challenge us with the concept of mutual accountability. We are all, and we should all be accountable to one another. I love to see all the words that were being thrown out at the end of the last general session. It was inspiring. It was empowering. It was full. All those great words. One words are great. But Mutual accountability needs to be a part of that because the reason that what happened then and the reason that yesterday the president was able to sign that was because there was a 94-year-old little lady who said this day needs to be recognized. 
And she couldn't do it by herself because it took a plethora of people to help her do it. Succeeding and saving our children is going to take a plethora of people to do it. Succeeding and helping our communities move forward and continue the mission that they started is going to take a plethora of people to do it. So I'm going to leave you with this thought and then we're going to move on and I'm going to close out. The highest form of knowledge is empathy for it requires us to suspend our egos and live in another's world. So at some point we got to get to the point where we realize it's not about just what I know. It's not about just how, how much success I've attained. It's not just about who my last name is, who I'm connected to, you know, the job that I have, the title that I have, my eco, you know, my, my economic status, but it's about, can we look at somebody else and see goodness in them? And then be willing to say, the only way that I can really pass down my knowledge, the only way that I can really be of help and really serve out that mutual accountability to understand that our black and brown youth and their backstories matter. And the only way we truly fully fulfill the dream of our ancestors to continue to propel our young black and brown young people forward, don't sympathize, empathize. Empathize with somebody else. Allow somebody else to understand I'm here. I may not understand where you are, but I understand where you, where you can go. A paradigm shift is needed. We need to stop meeting our, we need to stop having children meet us where we are, but in fact, meet them where they are. Juneteenth really stands for love. It stands for trust. It stands for belonging to a greater race, but none of that matters unless we're having these conversations. And the only way we truly begin to have conversation is to empathize with each other's reality. I thank you for your time. I hope that today we're not just celebrating Juneteenth as the 4th of July. We're not just celebrating Juneteenth as a Memorial Day, but we're celebrating the freedom of how we move our communities forward, understanding our path, but looking at what lies ahead and how do we collectively get all of us to that other end. I thank you. I, I, you know, I, I thank you for choosing to come and be a part of this particular session. And um, I, I often get this question, how do we find you? How do we follow you? Please, let's stay connected. Let's continue to have these conversations. You can find us on social media. You can find us on Facebook. You can follow Dr. Shirley. Thank you, thank you. I, I think I went over by one minute. Any questions, comments, or concerns? And I'm gonna stop sharing. I wanna say thank you. Thank you, thank you for this presentation and telling it like it really is. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I love your passion and, and you really exuded just the work that you're doing. And I pray that God just continues to anoint you to do what you need to do. We need people like you. Our kids need.